Well, today is the first time I have presented this lecture, this presentation. It takes, usually when I'm working on presentations, I, I dedicate at least a couple of months for each one. Not 100% of the time, but I'm working on it steadily for two months. I've been working on this one for four months, and I was still making changes 10 minutes ago. It is such an important subject. I want to do honor to Sir Ernest Shackleton. And so it will, it's not something I will ever be satisfied with. I will always try to improve upon this presentation because it represents the most epic story in the history of exploration. Now, some of you have asked, how do you decide what presentations you're going to make? And I started thinking about this presentation in 1999 when I went to the National Geographic Society headquarters in Washington, D.C. And I walked up to this small boat and I touched it and I felt almost a spiritual experience that this was the boat that we'll be talking about today. Sir Ernest Shackleton's boat, the James Caird. And so we will now begin by introducing you to Ernest Shackleton. He was born in Ireland, the son of a, a, a modestly successful physician. Apparently he was very popular, got along well with everyone, although he was a little bit moody. But one of the most remarkable things about him was his courage, his persistence, and the fact that in spite of all of the difficulties that he encountered, he was incurably optimistic. Boss was what his men called him. There's sort of a, a ring of familiarity there to the term boss, but also there's an aura of, there's a recognition of the fact that he in fact is in charge, that he is really the leader. And so that term is what his men called him. They never called him anything but boss. Now at this point in time, and we're talking about the early 20th century, the last great frontier was Antarctica. And all of the nations of the world, the major nations, were trying to be the first to reach the South Pole. Captain Robert Scott led the first expedition. England wanted to be the first. And so he tried in 1901, didn't quite get there. In fact, didn't even get close. 745 miles from the pole, had to turn back. He was accompanied by Ernest Shackleton on that expedition. Several years later, Shackleton, still, the, the South Pole had still not been conquered yet. Shackleton set out to lead an expedition to be the first to reach the South Pole. They did not make it. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. They did not make it. They ran out of supplies. They were the first ones to climb the uh, only the tallest active volcano in Antarctica, but again, failure. And then in 1911, a Norwegian by the name of Roald Amundsen became the first to reach the South Pole. It was such a devastating blow to England. They had so much wanted to claim that prize, but they were not able to. But Shackleton, in an effort to reclaim the glory for England, set out in 1915 to be the first to cross the entire Antarctic continent. And that's where our story begins today. He advertised he needed to fill out a team of 27 people. And this was the advertisement that he put out in the, uh, the various media of the day. Small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. This was a good example of truth in advertising because all of those things happened to the men who accompanied him. 5,000 individuals applied in spite of that advertisement for the 27 positions. And as you can see, he was trying to find, uh, it was a, a very, uh, a lot of different specializations surgeons, geologists, meteorologists, and so forth, and a photographer. 
and let me introduce you to the photographer because it is his pictures. 90% of the pictures I will use today were generated by this man, Frank Hurley. As you can see, he was very, very well thought of by uh, the first officer of the expedition. And it was this man to whom we owe gr a gr great debt of gratitude for the pictures that we'll be looking at today. Shackleton's crew set out for Buenos Aires. And it was the same day that Germany declared war on Russia. And he went to the, the Admiralty and said, look, we'll cancel the expedition. If you need us, all of us, we'll join, join the Navy. But they said, no, go forward, proceed with your expedition. So they did, they went down to Buenos Aires and this is the ship, well, let me back up just a little bit, and then they would go on to South Georgia Island. This is the ship, the Endurance, and as you can see from the Shackleton family motto, by Endurance we conquer, that was the reason the ship was named Endurance. It was perhaps the strongest wooden ship ever built in the history of the world in terms of the strength of the beams and the hull. It was specifically created for Arctic exploration. There was an expectation that it would hit icebergs and, and ice flows and that it would have to be able to survive that. As you can see, there were three masts and also a smokestack. So it was both uh, wind-driven as well as uh, steam engine-driven also. And this is a picture of Shackleton and some of his crew on the way. They went to Gritviken Harbor, South Georgia Island. And I understand that some of you may have been there fairly recently with Holland America. Raise your hand if you have been. A lot of you have been. Oh, I envy you greatly. This is a picture that was taken by Hurley. That's the endurance right there. Give you a sense of scale. And so this is where they were getting closer to the Antarctic. And the whaling captain said, don't go. This is the worst year we have seen for ice in our entire memory. So the ship waited in Gritviken Har Harbor for a month, hoping that the ice would break up. And then they couldn't wait any longer, and they proceeded down through the South Sandwich Islands until they reached the outer portion of the loose pack ice. And this is some, these are some pictures that were taken along the way, sort of domestic uh, pictures of, of uh, the crew. They had uh, quite a few dogs on board because there, it was going to be a, a dog sled uh, expedition across the Antarctica. And then they reached the loose pack ice. And that's when they started to see the magnitude of the issue in front of them. They sailed fairly easily through the loose pack ice initially. From time to time, they would take shelter in the lee of an iceberg in order to avoid the, the strong winds that are very common in that part of the world. And then it became locked in ice. The whaling captains had told them the truth. And in fact, the ice was horrible. They became locked in the ice. And by the way, I'm going to be quoting Shackleton quite a bit, so I won't mention that it's Shackleton speaking each time, but each time I give a quote, assume that it's Shackleton. If, and he realized that his plan for an exhibition, expedition was over. If one goal is gone, I will create another one. I will bring all of my men back alive. So he totally changed the objective to bringing his men back alive. From time to time, leads would open in the ice and the men would chop, uh, try and open it up as much as possible. They'd fire up the coal engine and try and ram their way through, but it did not work. And finally, February 24, 1915, Shackleton admitted, we're not going to be able to break out of here. We're going to have to stay put for the rest of the winter. And so, the ship became a, in effect, it was no longer a, a floating shore, it was no longer a, fl a ship that was afloat, but rather a shore station. He changed all the rules uh, and the men settled down for a long time. They didn't realize how long it would be. 
Their goal had been to reach Valsal Bay. That was where they were going to go ashore and start to cross the Antarctica. But they never made it, and the ship locked in ice for almost a year, moved in a northwest direction. Now, the reason for that, you'll notice that Antarct the land itself is sort of like a U-shape, and the prevailing winds and currents moved the ship gradually in a northwest direction. They had 60 uh, or so, 69 sled dogs from Canada, and uh, they were a source of, of uh, high morale for the, for the men on the ship. They befriended the dogs, they enjoyed being with them. Their kennels were on the deck, and they would take them off the ship and exercise them. They'd have sled dog races and so forth. And so that was a sort of a, a diversion for uh, the men of the endurance. And in fact, when it became clear that they weren't going to be going anywhere fast and that they would have to uh, go through the Ar Antarctic winter, they created shelters for the dogs that they called dog loos. And then finally, the winter arrived, the polar night. And this is what Shackleton said. In all the world, there is no desolation more complete than the polar night. It is a return to the ice age. No warmth, no life, no movement. Without the sun, day after day and week after week, few men can fight off its effects altogether. And it has driven some men mad. You recall he had been on two expeditions previously. He knew what he was talking about. So they had to, in effect, get used to the idea that they were going to have to stay on that ship for a long period of time through the polar night and winter. They moved all of the men down into the hold and created an, an area where they would all live together. He realized the importance of work and he put the men to work. This is the, the area where they slept, where they lived, where they ate, and he made sure that the men kept it sparkling clean. It was important to establish a routine under these circumstances. So every night, the dinner was served at a particular time in order to provide a little bit of structure to the monotonous day. At this point, they expected to be able to sail back to England when the ice started to break up. So the morale was still very, very high at that point. As you can see from the smiles on their faces, uh, uh, they were trying to make the best out of a difficult situation. Shackleton thought that long hair would lower the morale, so he got everyone to shave their head. And that's why everyone has uh, no, hardly any hair on their heads. But they played cards, they played various board games and so forth. And according to Shackleton, the Ritz was, quote, a scene of noisy merriment, a strange contrast to the cold, silent world that lay outside. And so every Saturday, they would gather together and raise a toast to our wives and our sweethearts. May they never meet. <laughs> oh my goodness, I, I have such an admiration for individuals who under adversity can can smile and, and be cheerful. Uh, they would gather around the fire. They had coal on board the ship, so they were using coal at this point for heat during the night. During the day, quote unquote, it was still black as night, they would take measurements of the celestial bodies in order to determine where the ship had drifted in the ice. They would weigh the dogs and have dog races and, and just try and sort of keep an air of normality going. He had to keep the men occupied. He had to keep them occupied in order to keep their morale up. And after eight months on the ice, they were still in high spirits. That's Shackleton right there. But there's, some, there's a little bit of concern, but still also in very, very high spirits. October 14, 1915. The ice was in convulsion ahead of the ship. A, splintering, a splitting crash suddenly caused all hands to rush up on deck to find that a crack had opened from the lead ahead to another crack that opened aft. 
In other words, the Antarctic spring was beginning. The solid ice that the endurance had been locked into was now beginning to break up into ice flows. And the men's spirit soared. They thought, now finally we'll be able to break loose and sail home. And we'll have some wonderful stories to tell. But that was not to be. I told you that the Endurance was perhaps the strongest wooden ship ever built in history. But unfortunately, its design, it had a square hull rather than a rounded hull. And that being the case, the ice flows started to crash into the ship from the side. It would not rise above the ice flows as it would have if it had a rounded hull. She was being crushed, not all at once, but slowly. She cried in agony. Her frames and planking, her immense timbers, many of them almost a foot thick, screamed at the killing pressure as the killing pressure mounted. She was like an animal in its death throes. They had to abandon ship. The hull was being crushed. It was being filled with water. Fortunately, the ship, they had several days in order to remove supplies from the ship. They were able to remove three and a half tons of supplies. And during this time, Hurley dove into the ice water in the hold of the ship to retrieve his prints and his, his, his negatives and his, his glass plates on which his photographs are recorded. And here are some pictures of the ship before it went under. That's the number two. Uh, Wild was his name, Frank Wild. <clears throat> so they had to set up camp on an ice flow, a very, very large ice flow. There's Shackleton on the, on the left there. And uh, they had quite a few supplies, as I indicated. And they were making the best they do with it as they could. They called this camp the Ocean Camp. It was their first camp on the ice. Now, fortunately, the temperatures were moderating. It was getting closer and closer to the Antarctic season, uh, Antarctic summer season. Here are some pictures of the camp. They developed a, a routine there. To just give you an idea about Shackleton and his leadership style, he had all of the most difficult personalities, he assigned them to his own tent. There were 18 r reindeer skin sleeping bags that had been made for the expedition, and the rest of the sleeping bags were ones pulled together from, from wool. He made sure that he and none of the officers got the best sleeping bags. So he was always setting an example for all of his men. Here's another picture, and there's a platform that they used to get high up and take celestial sightings to, again, make, find out where they were uh, in terms of, of their geographic location. But that high platform was also used to identify animals that they could kill, that they could hunt and kill, because they needed fresh meat. They had a lot of provisions, but the, the fresh meat was necessary. And so the kind of animals that they killed are pictured here. Crab eater seals, uh, Adelie penguins. Um, one kind of seal hunted them, the leopard seal. Several times men came running back to camp with a leopard seal coming after them. And they were able to kill those leopard seals and other seals. That was a major source not only of food but blubber which was used for their lamps and for their stoves. Well, after two months, Shackleton decided that I feel sure that it is the right thing to attempt a march. It will be much better for the men in general to feel that even though progress is slow, they are on their way back to land. And so, as you can see, they started pulling their boats. There were three boats. Unfortunately, each boat weighed 2,000 pounds. The sledges 
that the dogs would pull weighed a thousand pounds each. And it became very apparent only after six miles of trying to move forward with these heavy loads that it became apparent that they could not continue on. And so they set up another camp, patience camp. Here's Shackleton, and, and that's actually Hurley there, our photographer. He seems to be cutting blubber away from uh, a, the hide of some animal. This is the stove that they used to melt their ice to create water. There's the spigot, and they would load the blubber in there in order to provide the fuel. Shackleton was trying to be close to his men, uh, when they found a pack of cards, he taught them how to, to play bridge. Uh, he was always uh, enjoying their company, but he also kept a certain aloofness that kept him apart. He was simply emotionally incapable of forgetting, even for an instant, the position and responsibility that he had. The responsibility was entirely his, and no man could take it from him. So it was always on his mind. So as you look at these pictures, imagine the thoughts that were going through his mind. Well, it had become apparent that they would not be able to use the dogs to pull the sledges. And the dogs could, would eat one seal each day, a seal which could feed the men for a week. And so it became necessary to bid farewell to the dogs. Frank Wilde, who had been the main keeper of the dogs, uh, very close to them, would later write, this duty fell upon me. It was the worst job I've had in my life. I have known men I would rather shoot than the worst of dogs. And so it was his task to carry out the termination, the execution of the dogs. Well, for three months, the patient's patient's camp, yeah, I'm sorry, it started here, for three months, it drifted northward, again, continuing that path northward. The ice flow began to split into smaller and smaller flows. In patient's camp, the ice flow was a half a mile in diameter, but it get, kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller, until finally, one night, it split in half. Half of the camp was on one side and half was on the other. Shackleton quickly consolidated all of the men on one side. They launched the boats. Now, this is something that they had been looking forward to because they realized at some point in time they needed to get into open water with the boats so that they could proceed on to their destination. But this was a very dangerous time because they're the ice flows were colliding with each other and they could easily crush the boats. But fortunately, after a period of, short period of time, and at night they would pull the boats out up onto ice flows, after a short period of time they were finally able to make it into the open ocean and sail without, unimpeded by the ice. This was their destination. Elephant Island. The boats were launched April 9, 1916, and that is where they wanted to go. Now, this was a horrendous period of time. For six days, these small boats were overwashed by the ocean. The boats filled with water. The men's clothing became frozen solid at times. They were so exposed to the elements. The last two days, they didn't have any fresh water at all. One ship's biscuit a day for food. One of the men would write, we looked at the biscuit for breakfast, we sucked on it for lunch, and we ate it for dinner. Lack of sleep. The last 50 hours, it was so rough that they were not able to sleep at all. But they finally made it to Elephant Island. And it's called Elephant Island, possibly for two re uh, one of two reasons, or maybe both of them. The island is shaped like the head of an elephant, and there are elephant seals who inhabit the island. That island was 346 miles from where the Endurance had sunk six months earlier. Finally, they were on solid ground 
after 16 months of being on ship or ice. As you can see, there wasn't much flat ground there. That's the high tide mark. And so they realized that would, they, they had to find a, an area that had more land above the high tide level that was relatively flat. And they sailed and sailed and finally found a secure landing area that was 100 feet wide, 50 feet deep. So in other words, there wasn't a lot of flat land above the high tide line. And how happy they were to finally have a place that was solid ground. And this is a picture of their first hot meal in many, many days. And according to one person who was there, um, okay, that they ate and they drank and they ate and they drank all day long until they couldn't eat or drink anymore. Look at their expressions, everyone. Just exhaustion, but also relief. And here's a picture of Shackleton and his number two, Frank Wilde. They realized that they could not stay there because ships did not visit Elephant Island. They could not expect to be rescued. There was no chance of any search being made for us on Elephant Island. A boat journey in search of relief was necessary. And of the three boats that they decided to use, they chose the James Caird, a 22-foot-long whale boat. And those of you who came here a little bit earlier saw me pacing off on the stage 22 feet. So imagine from where I'm standing to approximately here. That's how wide, how long the boat was. Two feet clearance above the water. They outfitted the boat. They had a carpenter, Chippy McNish, and they put stones in the boat. Again, the importance of ballast. They covered the top of the boat except for a two by four foot opening that was used by the person who would be steering the boat. Very, very crowded quarters for those who went. And so Shackleton said, I called the men together, explained my plan, and asked for volunteers, and many came forward at once. Now, after such a horrendous experience just getting to Elephant Island, you might wonder, why would they volunteer to go back out into the ocean again? And I've thought about that quite a bit, and I think that many of them concluded that it would be better to die quickly on the ocean than to die slowly of starvation and exposure on Elephant Island. So there were many volunteers, and these are the individuals that Shackleton chose for his crew. It only could handle six people. Captain Frank Worsley was needed because he was the navigator. He needed to find the way to get to their destination. Tim McCarthy, an in incredible optimist, always a smile on his face, I think, Shackleton chose him just so that he would uplift the spirits of the men. The other three men were taken because they would have caused a lot of problem if they had been left behind. Again, think about that. He was concerned that these men would destroy the morale of the individuals who were left behind on the island. This individual was sort of an antisocial person. He was a bully that nobody liked. Chippy McNish, the carpenter, they needed his skills, but he was also the most mutinous person in the crew. And so Shackleton decided to take these five men with him on a voyage from which they did not expect to return. Now this is where they were, Elephant Island. They had three choices of where they could go. Ushuaia, the Falkland Islands, Stanley, or South Georgia. And they chose that one, even though it was much farther by the way, this is the route that the Amsterdam will be taking. So this is, at least as I understand it, as, as far as I can discern from the itinerary. And so you won't be right close to Elephant Island, but you'll be in that general vicinity as you go down to the Palmer Archipelago. So why did they choose the longest distance? 
Well, here we have a map showing that area. Because of the Earth's rotation, it's like a river running from west to east at three miles per hour. So it would be very, very difficult to go due north or even more difficult to go west and reach your destination. Because the Antarctica, the continent of Antarctica is the tallest, is the, uh, has the highest average elevation of any continent in the world, the air flows off of it over the cold ice and where it meets the warmer ocean, large scale depressions, or rather a great difference in atmospheric pressure is created and large scale depressions occur and the result of that is high winds, huge waves, and gales are worse more than 20% of the time. And because of those kinds of conditions, over the last 400 years, more than 1,000 ships and 15,000 lives have been lost. Of course, most of those were during the age of sailing many, many years ago. So, Shackleton wouldn't take more than four weeks of supplies. He realized that if they did not reach South Georgia Island within four weeks, that would mean that they will have died or they will have missed it entirely. And so they set off one day. This is the James Caird as it's being launched into the oceans. The men were who were staying behind made a pathetic little group on the beach with the grim heights of the island behind them and the seas seething at their feet. But they waved to us and gave us three hearty cheers. There was hope in their hearts. They trusted us to bring the help that they needed. The men who were left behind had to create shelter. They tried to dig into a, and make an ice cave with a glacier. Uh, the ice melted due to their body heat and their stoves. So they created a shelter using the other two boats that had been left behind. Frank Wilde, the number two in command, was left behind to, to keep the men uh, alive until Shackleton could return. These were very, very cramped quarters, uh, and it was just a horrific place to live, to take shelter. The Caird sailed off amidst the icebergs and ice. And fortunately, they had Frank Worsley along. There was no margin of error. They had to land on a 25 mile wide island, more than a thousand miles away. And if they missed it, they would be 3,000 more miles of open ocean before they would reach land. In other words, they would perish. They had to be right the very first time. Shackleton said, I had a very high opinion of his accuracy and quickness as a navigator, especially in the snapping and working out of positions in difficult circumstances. And this is a picture of Worsley using his uh, sextant in order to snap, in other words, take a shot of the angle of the sun. And it was under the worst conditions. He had to hang on to the mast and other men would hang on to him and wait until they, the waves lifted him up so that he could see the horizon. We were a tiny speck in the vast vista of the sea, the ocean that is open to all and merciful to none, that threatens even when it seems to yield and that is pitiless always to weakness. The consciousness of the forces arrayed against us was almost overwhelming. We were a tiny speck in the vast, whoops, sorry. Nearly always there were gales. We would climb the next slope and catch the full fury of the gale when the breaking water surged around us. There were days and nights when we lay hove to, drifting across the storm whitened seas watching the uprearing masses of water flung to and fro by nature in the, in the uh, midst of the sea. Finally, after 15 days, they saw land, South Georgia Island, Worsley's 
navigation skills had worked a miracle. They weren't able to land, unfortunately, because there was a hurricane blowing that night. In fact, that hurricane sunk a 550-ton ship trying to reach South Georgia Island. They survived and entered the bay the next day. They were almost like astronauts coming back to Earth. And this is the little cove where they sailed into to take shelter, to recuperate. They had not had fresh water for days, and there was a little, a little spring, a brook that ran by there, and this is the cave where they took shelter. They had to take shelter for 10 days because the weather was so horrible. And so, wow, they made it. They were going to make it back to civilization, but there was a problem. There was another mountain, literally, to climb. They entered Hakon, King Hakon Bay. Now, there were two major whaling settlements on the other side of the island, Stromness Bay and Gritviken Bay. And there were two ways to get there. One would be to, and the nearest was Stromness, one was to go by sea, 150 miles, but their rudder had broken as they entered King Hakon Bay. The Caird had reached the end of its journey. It could go no farther. So the other alternative was 22 miles by land across South Georgia Island. But in the 75 years that men had been coming to South Georgia, no one had ever crossed the island. Why is that? Because that's what the island looks like. So these poor men, who had endured so much, still had more to endure. They were exhausted and weakened by the 16-day voyage. Trench foot, which is when your foot gets immersed in water and it's never able to dry out, it becomes a very, very painful condition. The only clothes they had were these worn and tattered, wet clothing. They didn't have any winter gear at all. And speaking of gear, no climbing equipment. They had a, a carpenter's adz, which is sort of a, a, um, um, a cutting tool that, that uh, carpenters use. They drove screws down through the soles of their feet to give them a little bit of traction. And that was it. They had to climb these mountains and cross glaciers with 50-foot crevices. So they proceeded forward from Hakan Bay. And this is the route that they took. It was a nightmare. 36 hours for these three men. Those three were the ones who proceeded, leaving the other three behind at Hakan Bay. And they struggled up and down mountains and across crevices until early on the second morning, they heard a faint and uncertain sound. Not sure what they heard. Was it the 6.30 steam whistle waking up the whaling community? They waited another 30 minutes to see if they would hear the steam whistle calling the men to work at 7 o'clock. Exactly to the minute, the shrill wail of the whistle carried across the mountains to them. This was the first sound from civilization that they'd heard in more than a year and a half. That afternoon, three boys came running down to the docks, frightened, being followed by three men in tattered clothing, long beards, long hair, blackened faces from the soot of their stoves. The three men had made it back to civilization. That night, a strong blizzard struck the island. And if it had occurred the previous two nights, either of the previous two nights, those three men would have died, the three men that had been left at Hakan Bay would have died, and the other men, the other 22 men back on Elephant Island would have died if it had struck either of the previous two nights. Well, immediately, a rescue effort was sent out Worsley got into a whale boat and they went around the island and rescued the other three who were waiting on the other side of the island. And at that point in time, Shackleton's only desire, I must 
rescue the men on Elephant Island. They immediately took a whaling boat down to Elephant Island. The ice was too thick. It couldn't make it through. They sailed up the Falklands. A Uruguayan boat sailed down with Shackleton. The ice was too thick. It sailed back. An Argentine relief vessel came from Ushuaia. It could not save the men. Over the next three months, three attempts, you can imagine how distraught Shackleton must have been. He could hardly sleep at night. He needed to get back to his men. And this is a picture of those men at that point in time. Shackleton had been gone, been gone for three months at that point in time. And really, there weren't too many who had any hope left at all. And then one day, Hurley, the photographer, walked down to the water's edge to gather some uh, sea, sea uh, animals. And he said, suddenly, Hurley pointed out to the sea, I called Marston. I called Marston to point out a giant piece of ice that bore a striking resemblance to a ship. We immediately called out, Shippo! It was the Yelcho, a Chilean government steam tug that was off the shore. And they could see it. And you can imagine the ecstasy, the relief of the men. They lit a fire, a signal fire. And Shackleton was on the first boat that came in. It was a race against time. They had to leave, gather the men quickly and leave before the ice closed in again. And so Sh Shackleton was on the first boat and he said, are you all well? And the reply from his number two, we are all well. And so for the boss, we, for the very first time, Shackleton knew that in fact, every single one of his men was still alive. They went out to the boat as quickly as they could. And according to one of the, the uh, witnesses there, they uh, ate as much food as they could and started drinking at one o'clock in the afternoon. And by one o'clock in the morning, there wasn't a drop of liquor left on the boat. <laughs> I, who can begrudge them? They sailed to Punta Arenas. And this is a picture of the Yelcho entering Punta Arenas Harbor. That's Shackleton, that's the captain of the tug. These are the men in front of the city hall in Punta Arenas. Look at their faces, everybody. Look at those smiles. Shackleton was still very serious. He must have been totally worn out from physically and emotionally from the experience. He would later write, we had pieced, pierced the veneer of outside things. We had suffered, starved, and triumphed, groveled down, yet grasped at glory. We have seen God in her splendors, heard the text that nature renders. We had reached the naked soul of men. He was so, so relieved. Tragically, Shackleton, in a subsequent year, several years later, was on an expedition to circumnavigate Antarctica, and he died at the age of 45 of a heart attack. He was buried here, Gritvikten Harbor. Oops, I'm sorry, didn't mean to do that. Alexander Macklin, a surgeon, wrote, I think that this is as the boss would have had it himself, standing lonely in an island far from civilization surrounded by stormy, tempestuous seas and in the vicinity of his greatest exploits. And that is where he is today. And I talked to someone yesterday who has vi visited his gravesite. And by the way, six years ago, his right-hand man, Frank Wilde, his ashes were interred on the right side of that grave. Everyone, that is the end of my last presentation, and I would like to share with you an old Irish blessing. May the road rise up to meet you.
May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God help you, hold you in the palm of his hand. Thank you.